Well, hello, Internet. Uh, my name is EJ, and yeah, this is going to be my first commented video. Um, my Apocalypse Centaur art piece that I created for a uh, conceptart.org competition. Uh, it was for a Character of the Week competition. Um, I'm not too sure about how often I'm going to be able to do this commented time lapses. Uh, I'm kind of just experimenting right now just because I found myself with a little bit of free time so I decided hey why not um, try this commented time lapses. Um, it does take a lot of time and I, I am very aware of the time factors and the time constraints um, in creating videos such as this. My preference would be just to be doing artwork and then just recording it and then showing the time lapses, you know. Uh, that is the most economical <laughs> thing for me to do. Um, but I know that non-commented time lapses, uh, most people don't really learn a thing or two from there. Um, or, I mean, the... I mean, if you're an artist like me, you know, it, you could learn a thing or two just by watching silent time lapses. But for some people, I know some people learn differently, and for them, it might be a lot more effective if there's like the auditory component to the time lapse, so then things would click for them. Um, and I'm very well aware that there's um, different sets of learners, basically, or different set of ways of learning, so. So yeah, I'm kind of adding to my repertoire instead of just doing time lapses for my artwork. I'm just I'm gonna try and do commented time lapses if I have the time, but yeah. So enough about that introduction. Uh, let's go talk about this piece that we're seeing right now. Uh, I did mention that this was for a competition. Um, character of the week competition conceptart.org uh, and the prompt for the competition was Apocalypse Centaur uh, so basically we were tasked or asked to design the four horsemen essentially but instead of it being just like a regular you know humanoid type of figure the twist is that you know they're gonna be centaur half animal half um, half human or half animal half human so just like a centaur uh, so that was the twist of the prompt instead of it being like the four horsemen of the apocalypse it's the four centaurs of the apocalypse essentially and we were tasked to design it and uh so yeah the idea was to have a centaur a, a human and an animal um so Anyways, going with my piece um, and what I decided to turn in for the competition. Um, initially, I already kind of have an idea of what the image I wanted. I, I wanted it to be like a zombie look to it, which is pretty much just what I ended up with, you know. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, even though I kind of had like a strong image in my head initially, even before I started doing the thumbnails, um, I still went through the thumbnailing process just because it's a good habit to have when you're in the planning stages of any kind of illustration. Um, typically when you go with the first image that you have in mind, you, there's tendencies for a lot of things to go wrong so you know what most people do especially if they have no initial idea of how to approach the prompt you know because I've been in that position before where I was given a prompt and like my brain was just blank like I could not think of an image that would go well with that prompt and so you know I practice this thumbnailing process which is just like me you know, creating a bunch of shapes and creating a bunch of sketches that kind of just go so long with the prompt, but not really like, you know, it's just kind of just freeform style sketch, you know, just having fun, you know, knowing full well that 
what I'm doing in the thumbnail process isn't really going to be in the final. It's just, just kind of just like a warm up, you know. It's kind of like what basketball players do, you know, before a game, they do the warm up. You know, if you ever watch basketball live, you'll see them like right before an actual game, they'll do warm ups and whatnot. This thumbnail process is kind of just basically that, like a, like a warm up, you know, trying to get ideas down and whatnot. So, um, in this case, I'm going through like the general shape and form of like the artwork. That's kind of like what I'm after, essentially. So, you know, like the past five minutes, you've seen me just kind of like just make blocks of shapes and like a few lines just to kind of get like a general good idea of what the general shape of my character would be like, you know. Um, you could see right now, like, uh, right in front of us there's like a shorter guy but initially you know i have an image when i first read the poem i already had like an image that came to my mind you know so like even though i went through the thumbnailing process you know just to kind of like do like a warm-up thing i already kind of had a feeling of what i was going to do you know which was like the zombie apocalypse centaur you know but even though i have like the idea I think it was good that I did the thumbnail process because, you know, like with this thumbnailing process, it kind of helped me narrow, like, what the general overall look was going to be. And I realized that, you know, I, I really like, I think, number two. I, I know that this thumbnail process went through a selection um, vote with my family and friends. You know, I asked my family and friends, like, which one they liked, and uh, I, I think everybody ended with two or five. I don't remember what everyone voted, in all honesty. But if you look at the number two and five, you can see that um, two, especially number two, two was like tall, you know? And you see in the final image that I ended up going with a tall figure. Most of those initial thumbnail sketches that I made were kind of like short, stumpy creatures. They were, they were like short-legged. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so I guess this is a good uh, reason why, or a good example of why thumbnail process helps is because you know even though you have like a good strong image initially in your head you could refine some potential problems and in this case the potential problem was that you know the legs if i had gone with a short and stumpy you know character i mean there would have been nothing wrong with that i could have made it look good you know eventually if i just kept working on it but I think on this one, like the the tall and skinny centaur character, actually worked best. Um, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, number two was kind of tall, and I think two or five was like what people were leaning on in the first set of votes. And so based on those votes, I kind of made this second round of thumbnails, which is what we're like looking at right now. Uh, I'm about I'm sketching the first one and you can see that I the form that I laid down first was eventually tall because that's eventually what I ended up wanting to do was a tall centaur apocalypse centaur and so yeah uh, here I am doing a few more quick sketches uh, this time a little bit more detailed than the first one and on this second round of thumbnail process I actually um, I actually concentrated more on like the armor look, armor, armor, his armor, um, basically, and essentially like what he was gonna have around his body, you know, or on whether or not he was gonna be naked. Uh, so yeah, I think I did three thumbnails in general, and they were all kind of like the same in all honesty. At this point, they were all. Yeah, looking the same from what I remember. Uh, but yeah. Anyways, um, before uh, I know that the second round of thumbnails that we're doing is is proceeding. Um, but uh, instead of talking about this, I actually wanted to just go over real quick and talk about what it was with this piece that I absolutely love. Um, 
out of all the time lapses, I've posted quite a lot of time lapses already in my YouTube channel. When I decided to pick this first particular uh, video because, you know, I, I just love this piece. You know, I love how this piece ended. And the thing with me is that a lot of my pieces, you know, are kind of like... I mean, especially the polished ones, the ones that I spent a lot of hours on. Those are the ones that I mainly put in my portfolio. And, and you know, honestly, if you were to look at my portfolio, I can only pick like two or three that I'm still in love with, you know. Um, months or years after I made it. Um, most of the time... Um, most of the time, you know, like, uh, okay, let me rephrase that. Uh, <laughs> it's so weird to, like, say falling in love with a piece. Okay, um, let me rephrase by saying that, you know, if I look to, if I look at my portfolio right now, I could say that my pieces are just okay. <laughs> and, and it's not then I'm being a perfectionist or I'm like dragging myself down or anything. It's just, I, I see too many errors essentially, you know, and I cannot override the errors that I see, you know, while there's a few pieces that, you know, even though they're not like the best pieces in my portfolio, I still love them just because it was just the way you look, <laughs> you know, and this happens to be just one of them, you know. I, I typically don't do zombie pieces. I typically don't do macabre pieces. Uh, mac macabre, I don't think I mispronounced that. I, I don't do gross, grotesque stuff, you know? Um, even though I love Peter Polak, if, if you guys watch After His Graphics on YouTube, he's an absolutely phenomenal artist and he does a lot of zombies and I totally look up to him. And he is one of my favorite, but even though he is one of my favorite artists, I just I don't do his kind of genre stuff. I just don't do horror. It's not me, you know. But for some odd reason, this particular piece I just absolutely love. And the reason why is because I love the lighting on this piece. You know, it was just one of those few successful paintings. Um, looking at all my portfolios, some are just okay, like I said, you know. And it happens, you know. You have your successes and you have your failures, you know, and you learn from your failures and you move on. You try to get better with your craft and your next piece, you know. And with this piece, you know, when I look at it, I still see some errors, you know, just like I do with any of my pieces. But like, you know, the things I love about it override, you know, the things I don't like about it, you know. So, yeah, um... I would have to say that this is part of the reason why I picked this as the first piece to make commentaries on because even though it's not the best zombie apocalypse centaur out there, I mean just do a search on on art station for apocalypse centaur or centaur in general and I guarantee you you will find 500 other pieces that look way better than this, you know, and it's going to be true. But for me personally, I just, I don't know why, but I just love this piece. And it's because of the lighting. It is one of the, it is one of the pieces where I went dark first and then like lighten it up. And it, I think that really helped push the illustration. But anyways, um, enough about that little tidbit that I just went off into about how I'm still in love with this piece. Um. Yeah, going back to what's going on in the screen right now, um, you can see that uh, I'm still in my second round of thumbnails, you know, doing a little bit more details and whatnot, um, kind of refining some ideas, and you can see that some of the thumbnails I'm already creating are already getting close to, like, the final image, which is, you know... Which is good. So yeah. Um, and it's good because, you know, things are getting more refined in my head and getting more clear. And, you know, when things are clear in your head, it kind of gives you like a good direction to go to with your painting, essentially. So yeah.
Now looking back at this thumbnail process, I realized that there was this one detail that I wish I'd been able to keep that um, didn't make it into the final illustration. And it's the spilled guts um, detail. And you can see it in this piece that I'm working on right now. Um, yeah, it's a... Uh, that spilled guts are like showing through and uh, and it didn't really show or um or I didn't really kept that for the final image I'm not, I'm not sure why I didn't keep that for the final image cuz uh, I think that detail would have looked absolutely cool but yeah um I think it was partially just because of the fact that, you know, with all the details that I put in with the sword and like the the hanging bar, uh, spiky um, things, uh, I figured that having the spilled gut look was just going to be like an overload of information that, you know, it just ended up scratching it out and not making it in the final scene. but. In, this, in that sketch that um, we just kind of was looking at and looking through, it, it just looks absolutely phenomenal to just have that detail. So yeah, I, I wish it was kept in the final, but um, the final is just good without it. Or the final still looks good without it. So yeah, in this particular thumbnail that I'm making right now, I just realized that uh, this would have been another cool one or a cool direction for the image to have gone through, you know. Um, instead of having to be so dependent on the overall armor look, just be just push the look of the skin being all grotesque and rotting and whatnot, all more zombie-like. And I think this is what I was going for with with this particular one um yeah uh this would have been a, another good direction for the illustration to have gone with obviously i ended up with the one with the armor um but yeah I, either direction it would have gone with you know I, I think it would have presented its own set of problems and unique challenges One thing for sure though is that throughout this whole process I was very keen on nailing down like the overall lighting uh, and I think that's part of the reason why this piece was successful at least for me anyways you know is because of the, the lighting um, I really focus in on that um, so yeah I really had that a lot in my mind when I was making this piece There you go. That's my three sets of uh, thumbnails. 
And again, I presented to me, I presented these thumbnails to my family and friends, asked them to vote, whatnot. Um, and I, I think the votes were all kind of lining up with each other, anyways. Um, I, I think we all. I mean, obviously, I ended up in number two in this particular one. Um, two is the one that resembled the final illustration the most. Um, but I don't know if if that was like my particular choice and I overrode like the vote or if the vote was actually two. I, I think the vote, if I'm not wrong, was leaning towards two. Um, and then I became like the deciding factor. I was, you know, maybe it was like tied and I think I decided to go for two or whatnot. Uh, I'm not really sure how that voting process went. But I know that two won. Two won. So... With that being the winner, I took that thumbnail and then redrew it with a little bit more details. And then, yeah, here I am sketching uh, what my illustration would look like. Or uh, laying down the base look of the the illustration So while this video is uh, showing me with or showing the initial resketching process, uh, I wanted to talk about um, uh, some more about this piece. I want to talk some more about this particular entry of mine. Um, this is probably one of the first Chow entries that I made where I didn't photo bash as much. Um, and I love it because you know I didn't I, I tried to photo bash with this in all honesty I tried to add fo photos in but in the end I think I only kept like a, a few if I'm not wrong I kept like the ground uh, photo bash in and then the, the cloak or uh, his cape not the cloak his cape uh, I kept the photo texture of the cape I try to put photo textures on the skin, like the whole bloodiness and gross zombie effects, but none of them stuck, and all of it, I just ended up doing uh, brushwork on it. You know, like changing my brush out for different sets of uh, texture brushes, which is not my typical style at all. There's so many good artists out there that, you know, don't even photo bash because they do everything with brushwork, you know, and I don't know how they do it. Because I'm like Mr. Simple Guy. I stick with my simple round brush, you know. You just use that and then one textured brush that looks like a chalk. And that's it. Those are like my two brushes that I use often. Um, except for the random mecha brush on Krita. That brush is so amazing to start out with. I always like probably like 60 to 70% of the time I start out with the random mech brush. And you've probably seen that. You've probably seen me use that a lot in some of my time lapses. But anyways, my, my brush set is really simple. I keep it, you know, as simple as I can because I just want to just do painting, as, you know, to solve most of everything that needs to be solved, you know, just straight up painting. But anyways, um, I use photos to help enhance, like, a lot of the details that needs enhancing. You know, that is the only thing that I am weak at because some artists out there you know they don't photo bash as much they just use straight up brushes you know and they're really good at it you know they can get extreme deals with just brushes um, I on the other hand don't do that as often um, I guess it's just the, my style that I've developed over years I'm more of a photo bash guy rather than photo bash guy rather than a, a brush kind of guy 
But for this particular piece, I didn't photo bash as much, like I was saying. And again, this is another reason why I love this piece. I really depended on, on brushes on this one, especially doing all the textures that I needed for the skin. It was just pretty much all brushes. Okay, so now you've seen me finish the outline. I'm laying in like the basic colors. And then I go through this process real quick. Uh, the process I'm going through right now is just getting to a base painting. Or like a, what I call the base paint. Basically the base paint has all the necessary lighting information and all the necessary color information that I need in order to render details out. So it, it goes real quick for me. You know, this is probably like one of the fastest process for me where I just, you know, an hour or two or three even, um, I would just lay down as much as information, as much color and value information as I can on my piece. And this is the part where I photo bash the most too. You know, this is where I just start throwing random photos like crazy, you know, just trying to get some some color in, you know, lighting information in. And then as soon as I get them all in, I would merge them all into one layer and then um, use Krita's blender brush to kind of all just smush them in so that I would get like a, a base paint um, to do my details on. Um, you could kind of see me do it early in this particular piece like I'm already blending on this piece and I don't know why I did that given that you know the value of this particular layer that I'm blending isn't quite as good as it needed to be but uh, maybe I had like a different thought process in my mind then during this this phase right now because this is this is not my typical standard thing to do I typically throw in a lot more information before blending ah, yeah see I stopped myself blending and I threw in more color information okay so yeah I'm trying to put in more information So I'm working on this guy, working on the background. And I think this is another reason why I think I love this piece is the background. The background was so easy to work on. That fog idea, I don't know where I got the idea to put the fog in to hide the rest of the zombie monster, you know, creepy ghost in. I, I don't know where I got that idea to, to put a fog in and hide all those ghosts in there. Um, but it was an excellent idea because it was such a time-saving factor for for this piece if I hadn't done that if I you know ended up with a totally different background than the foggy background that I have on the piece I think that this piece would have taken a lot more longer for me to finish but the, the background was just it just came together like so quickly and yeah I guess I got lucky in this in this piece in that regard because you know it just all just came together. But yeah, and here I am blending again. I don't know why I'm blending so early. It's this is not my typical style. I typically push it farther. But then again, this was done earlier in 2018 where I'm still kind of new to Krita. I didn't discover Krita until 2017. Technically, end of 2016 was when I discovered Krita. And I practiced some Krita all of 2017 and then 2018 I think was the year that I started really really maturing on, on my illustration. And and now 2019 here I am uh, with a little bit more um, mature style and a little bit more sure in my approaches. So yeah, I guess I've refined a little bit more of my style. But yeah, this is totally interesting to look back at it and, and to see how I was working on things before. Um, it's not that there's anything wrong with me blending too early, you know, I mean, there was absolutely nothing wrong with it. But just looking at it right now, I just feel like the value could have been pushed so much more, which I know it eventually got pushed a lot more later on.
But yeah, uh, I feel like I could have saved some time on this one if I hadn't jumped the gun too early on this one and not blend too early. Anyways, I'm making such a big distinction about the whole blending thing because the, the blender brush is the, uh, the brush that I use right before I start my rendering process, basically. Um, so basically, after I do my photo bash, and then I push the values, and I push the colors in, and after all that, like I said, I merge them all in one layer, blend them with the Curtis blender brush, which in my case, I really love the smudge texture, or the textured blender brush, I think is what it's called. And I love smudging things with that brush because, yeah, it, it has, like, a nice blend to it, basically. Um, but yeah, it's the last brush that I use before I start rendering things out with my with your regular just round brush. Because that's what I use to render things out, just a regular round brush. Sometimes, depending on the piece, I, I would use my uh, textured brush, uh, my chalk brush. But I don't do it often. I only do it with my speed paints. I typically use my chalk brush for my speed paints. For my full illustration, so when it goes for hours on end, um, I typically use just a regular round opacity uh, flow brush. So yeah, the opacity and the flow is set to pen pressure. And then it's just regular round. That's what I do. Uh, there it is. See, uh, by the time I finished blending, I realized that it wasn't dark enough, and so that's why I added another layer of multiply in there um, to really punch those values in. And then I came back with a color dodge layer. I, I do believe it's a color dodge layer. Yeah, yep, it is. Um, and then with a the color dodge layer, I kind of brought back some details in, or I brought some details back in. And so yeah, that this is the point where I should have been blending things, <laughs> but I blended a little too early. Yeah, but I think this is it. I'm getting to that base paint point that I've been talking about, the point where you know. I'm happy with the overall value and overall color scheme of things. Yeah, see, I, I put in, I turned it into black and white to check for values. Um, and that's a good technique, by the way, uh, just to let people know. Just for you to quickly check your values, add um, an all black layer, set it to color mode, and turn it on and off if you want to check the values of your piece. Um, Value is very important in illustration and in painting because, and I learned this like the past two or three years, um, I learned that value is so much more important than color, for example. Like you could throw in whatever color you want in any given piece, but if the value isn't set correctly, it's going to look odd. And so I've been paying a lot more attention to value like the past two or three years in my paintings. So yeah, always check your values whenever you're in the middle of a long illustration. There it is, the background. The background I was talking about, it came so quickly, you know. I thought of the fog and I thought of the monsters, kind of squished them in, sketched them in quickly. And like I said, it went by so fast, so quickly. And I'm so glad because it saved a lot of tremendous time for this illustration.
And here comes the photo bash in, a little too late. <laughs> like I said, typically I would do a photo bash before this part, but yeah, I decided, hey, why not do it now? So I'm doing it now. So yeah, quick little ground in, or putting a, putting a quick little background in for the ground. And by the way, before I forget, um, the photos I use are, are from textures.com. Great, great resource site. Um, they have uh, opportunities to get free textures um, daily, actually. You get free, fi fi free 15 textures, 15 free textures daily um, if you sign up. So that's really cool that they offer that. Wow, what a tongue twister that was to say. And here's another uh, fabric texture that I got from textures.com that I absolutely love. I always use this piece in a lot of my illustrations. I always photo bash this piece in. If if you look through some of my illustrations, you'll recognize this piece a lot. And in fact, you know, it, this piece is actually kind of funny because I've actually seen this particular photo in a lot of video games too. Um, if I'm not wrong, I think I've seen it in Dishonored. I could be wrong. I don't quote me on it. I don't want to say that the game Dishonored used textures from textures.com. So yeah, don't quote me on it. But if I'm not wrong, like that particular texture that I was using, that I got from textures.com, was also used in Dishonored. Or at least a similar texture. Anyways. So yeah. So while I um, do this photo bash and let me talk real quick about um, how my YouTube is set up. Um, if you look through my YouTube, you'll see that um, it's set up into different sections. Um, there's, you know, digital and then there's some traditional. I, I, I wish I have a lot more traditional stuff, but for now they're far and few between. I'm working on that, you know, but for now a lot of my pieces are digital. Um, but a lot of them are divided, you know, so if it's digital or if it's traditional, they're going to be divided into two. They're going to be divided into like the speed work and like the non-speed work. And that's the same thing for 3D too, digital 3D. You'll see me save some stuff under speed work and then some of this non-speed work. And I want to make a distinction about this. Um, the thing with like... Uh, full-blown illustrations such such as this one versus like my speed paints for example is that I, I love long illustrations I do I really do if I get a choice between doing long illustrations or speed paints I would go with long illustrations all day even though I would get you know fewer pieces in you know because it does take long on, on average it takes me about 30 hours to work on a long illustration piece and that's a really long time versus some of my speed paints that goes, you know, on average three hours. Um, that's my average for speed paint. And that's a huge gap. <laughs> I mean, that's three hours versus 30 hours, you know. But I love my 30 hour work though, even though it tests my patience all the time. And it, you know, like working a long piece is, is just so trying, you know. Because you get to a point like halfway through working on a long piece that you just want it done. You just want to see it done. You just want it over <laughs> to be over with, you know? Because you've been staring at it for days on end and you're just like, man, I just wish this is finished. So yeah, going through a long illustration is always trying. It always tests my patience. But the results are way better than my speed paints. With my speed paints, I have like a 50-50% you know, success rate. Some I love, some I just absolutely detest, some I don't even show to the world because it's embarrassing. It's like, no way. No way am I going to show that speed paint. You know, um, but with full-blown illustrations, no matter how bad the illustration is or how weak the illustration is, you know, if you solve the basic um, foundational issues those first few hours you know 
the piece you'll eventually end up with will end up looking okay, even though it's not the best. Um, a good example of that is my Robot Cafe illustration piece that I worked on. Um, and that piece is really weak. <laughs> you know, I I remember actually getting into an argument with... Well, it wasn't an argument. You know, it was like a difference of opinion. It was all polite. You know, we weren't like slinging bad words at each other or anything. But it was in conceptart.org and somebody mentioned something about Robo Cafe. And I, I don't know if I ignored it completely or, you know, if it was just the circumstances that... Like, if there were circumstances that made me forget his comment or, or whatnot. Um, I'm not sure, but I know that I wasn't, like, outright, you know, denying him or anything. Like, I wasn't, like, said, thinking, like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to listen to that guy. He has no good advice. Uh, the funny thing is, like, his advice was actually kind of good in the end. And I realized that his advice was very, very good. But anyways, um, my point about Robot Cafe was that it's a very, very weak piece. Um compared to like this piece which i absolutely love my robot cafe i ended up spending about 30 hours in now the reason why i put robot cafe as part of my main portfolio rather than some of my speed paints is just because even though even though that i think it's weak and it's not the best and you know just like the guy said there's some errors in it you know that i wish i had been able to fix in the thumbnail process um Overall, it still looks better than some of my worst speed paints. And that's the reason why I love doing illustrations like this. Like if I if I could just do long illustrations day in, day out, that would be my favorite thing to do. Now, in the real world, <laughs> uh, let me tell you, in the real world, in the real world, that doesn't work out very much like that. I mean, yeah, there's places that pays, you know, for that really wants the long illustrations but a lot of the places really wants they're dead they're deadline driven especially in the market anyways especially in the commercial market maybe if you were to work in the fine art market that is not the case you know you could take as much time as you want on an art piece in the fine art market but in the commercial market it is very much deadline driven and that's the reason why I you know the past two years or three years i started practicing speed painting when i first started digital painting about 10 years ago i never really did any speed paints you know i was weak at it and i knew i was weak at it and i, I guess since i was weak at it i didn't want to work on it because you know i'm like i'm weak at it and it always sucks working at it you know or i'm not sure i'm not sure what my mentality was but Eventually, the past two or three years, I changed that mentality and I was just like, well, let me hammer this down. Let me see what I can do with speed paints and see if I could, you know, get good at it. And and I want to say that I, I'm not really good at it. I'm, I'm in no way like Ati Gailin. I'm, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. But I'm definitely nowhere near like Snatty's level or, you know, Ismael and Tio Glue's level. Ismail in Sigu, is that how you say your name? I hope I'm pronouncing it right. And um, another speed painter I like, W Lop, W L O P, or I don't know how you would say it, but everyone knows him on DeviantR.com, W L O P. Um, he's another good speed painter too. Um, but yeah, my speed paints, you know, I mean, I don't think they're at those kind of level, but they're sufficient. And I know they're sufficient, and I know they, that they work, you know. And some of them I know uh, works well enough that I'm confident enough to post it in my portfolio. So yeah. Um, but since, yeah, things in the commercial market are just so much deadline driven i know i had to work on it and i've been working on it for the past few years but still though this is my love and this is the reason why i, I guess i went with this particular piece to make a commentary on because yeah i love my long illustrations i, I wish there's a word for it too you know because when you say illustration it's easy for people to think like speed paint illustration you know they don't really think illustration as like polished 
like sit down for 30 week 30 hours weeks on end kind of illustration and you just think like oh yeah you know it's like a quick drawing or something you know and yeah i hope that makes sense uh, uh, yeah i think that, that makes sense i wish just a word for 30 hour long illustrations or very long illustrations yeah because i just don't like say polished illustrations because it could be easily misconstrued by other people. But enough about that, I digress. Let's move on <laughs> to another topic. Which the topic at hand that I wanted to talk about. And then I was looking at the video, but I neglected to mention. Was the photos. There were, there were photos in there that was blurred out. Um, and what I wanted to go over those blurred out photos real quick. Were the, is that those were Google Photos that I was using. Um that I wasn't really sure what the the rights usage were so I just blurred them out um, but what those photos were were uh, reference photos I'm trying to get a good look on the face of this uh, apocalypse center guy and I was having problems and issues shading him and trying to get a good look on him and that's the reason why I had to pull some references in and this is why references is so important like I can't even stress it enough so many beginner artists think that using references is a cheat and like they shouldn't do it and it's like cheating or something it's not your work will get so much better if you use references so always use references always use references and um yeah, but be careful about your references. Obviously, you know, um, you have to respect other people's rights and whatnot. Um, so yeah, in that, in that particular case, I wasn't really sure what the rights, the rights wasn't laid out, the, the rights wasn't mentioned or whatnot. And so just to be on the safe side, I decided to just blur them out. Um, and that's the reason why I love textures.com because they're pretty much royalty free. You know, I always go to sites like that. Photobash.org is another good resource site too, where you could use royalty free photos. And if you can't find any royalty free photos or, you know, um, Creative Commons photos that's free to use commercially, um, you could always just take your own photos, which I do a lot. Um, if I'm not wrong, I took a few photos for for this piece because i was having problems with the hand I, I don't know why i didn't took reference photos for the face because i could have totally taken reference photos for the face instead of using the ones in google but i know that i took some photos um for the hand because i was having problems with the hand so i just grabbed my iphone and took a few photos of of my hand to help me out with illustrating this so yeah, I wanted to mention that.
the chest plate, the chest plate gave me such a hard time. Uh, I remember having to redo this quite a lot throughout the illustration process. Same thing with the shoulder plates, actually, as well as the face. Uh, I remember just not liking the overall look uh, of the plates and the chest plates. So yeah, I just have to keep on redoing it over and over again. As you can see, like especially on the stomach, now that like the majority of the information that I wanted is in there, like the chains going across from him, the the swords and whatnot, you can tell that having that spilled gut look that I was talking about earlier that I really wanted to keep, it was kind of hard to like pull it off because at this point there's just so many details like going on that. It just wasn't gonna like show up very well um, and I was beginning to sense that you know like at first like especially at this point in time right now I, I was still thinking like oh yeah I could put those spilled guts in there you know because I really liked it you know and I I'm thinking that I'm still gonna be able to pull it off and in the end I ended up erasing all of this in favor of, of like scabs uh, and whatnot or like little pimple looking uh, boils and skin uh, anomalies essentially and for that one I just ended up using a brush for that one um, again like I mentioned earlier you know typically I, I use photos for my details not so much as brushes for this particular one I, I use brushes uh, I found a brush that um, had a bunch of circles in it so I kind of just like you know put it all over the skin and that was gonna be like the pimple boil looking skin anomalies and then I also found like a brush that has like um, like crack marks you know like crack marks on the ground or something or in the cement and so I ended up uh, putting it all over his skin too to make it look like his skin was ripped uh, you'll see me go through the process later on but yeah for now I'm trying to detail his body out and render it and eventually a lot of this gets erased again um, at about this point in time the only thing that really was just kept from from this part of the illustration was the was his cape and uh, his staff that he's carrying with him uh, that pretty much stayed the same for the rest of the illustration I think this is another uh, point that I wanted to make that's worth mentioning. Um, part of the reason why I like this long illustrations is because it's a balancing kind of game. Um, with speed paint, you know, typically, you know, if you have a successful speed paint, by the time you're done with that speed paint, everything is balanced. You know, everything just came harmoniously for you. Um, once you start working on long illustrations like this where it stretches out for days, weeks, months, um, what ends up happening is that your frame of mind from day to day, from week to week, changes. And so whatever change you go through will need to be balanced out with what's already been on there. And that's the reason why like, uh, like with a very successful speed paint, Typically, it's balanced already and it doesn't need to be rebalanced or whatnot. Um, with long illustrations like this, a lot of balancing act needs to be done. Um, and I, I think that's the reason why I like, I like it because it's kind of like a troubleshooting kind of thing, you know, where it's like, you know, you you get this feeling that something is wrong with the photo or something is going wrong with the illustration, but you can't quite figure it out. So you try to do something, 
like add a detail or take out a detail and you realize that what you were doing was not what was wrong with the photo but instead it's making things worse you know so you gave up for that day and then woke up the next day and then you found out oh this is actually what i need to do and so on and so forth um so yeah it's a balancing act uh, i guess is the point that i'm trying to make that every little thing that you do needs to be rebalanced, recalibrated. Yeah. Unlike in a speed paint, in a speed work, typically, you know, the balance is just done in just one day, just, you know, came harmoniously for you because you just typically just work on it in one sitting, you know. When you do something in one sitting, you know, it's nothing changes, you know. I mean, well, your frame of mind for that day is going to be like what's imprinted in the painting essentially and since you're not going to be working in that piece anymore the next day no matter how much your frame of mind changes the next day or how much your mood or feelings change or whatnot it's not going to impact the painting anymore because it was a speed painting that's already been done but for an illustration you know that stretches out for days yeah um waking up the next day or working on a piece you know two three days later there's a change that is apparent you know because yeah i hope that makes sense so yeah Hi, Pandora. That was just so random. <laughs> that should have been edited out, but yeah, it was. Mm -hmm, it was in this video. Totally missed editing that part out, but it's okay. The ground was fairly easy to work on. Uh, with that photo that I pasted on there, um, it was just pretty much just straightforward. Um, I just put in some highlights, make the rocks look more 3D rather than flat. Because obviously when the photo was taken, it was, it was taken from top down, which made the rock look kind of flat. Since it's, yeah, from a photograph. Uh, but basically, um, that's all I had to do with the with the ground really was just kind of just make the rocks look more 3D so then the grounds look more solid. Here I am refining the shading more on the rest of the body which I, I've been doing back and forth. And I, I think I mentioned this earlier about how I erased everything, all the details I put in. Um, and that already happened actually quite a few minutes ago uh, when I was talking. But yeah, uh, I took out most of the tear, torn up skin details that I had in there initially because it was just wasn't going with the balance of the overall piece, you know. And this is when I was talking about balancing, rebalancing things add a detail take details out because you just kind of have to constantly watch how every little piece that you're working on balances with everything else that's already on the painting so yeah 
say see if you look at the stomach right now the the torn stomach is not there anymore because I knew that I was gonna have to replace it with some other details so yeah constant balancing rebalancing it's kind of like a game <laughs> And that's the reason why I like this kind of illustrations more than the speed paints. It feels like there's more love given. I really like looking at this leg right now. This is a well rendered part right here. This leg is pretty much covered up by the fog, by the foreground fog. And so I don't really get to see it often in the final piece. I now looking at it and I realize wow yeah, it's really well rendered. So even without the details in by now, um, the lighting and the colors are looking so good that even in the thumbnail, which you can see in the lower right right about now, um, the thumbnail looks, it just stands out. It looks really good. Um, that's when you can tell you have a really good illustration, really good piece going on is if the thumbnail reads very well, if it's really small. And it reads clearly, um, you know, you have a good illustration. There's some good illustrations out there that, you know, looks really good, you know, regular size when you look at it. Um, but in thumbnail size, it just does not look good. Um, environment paintings, illustrations typically comes to mind. And I think part of the reason why is just because, you know, especially with environment pieces, there's so much information going on that sometimes it just, it reads, it, it's hard to read, essentially, essentially in a thumbnail. The characters, uh, character pieces, um, they tend to read very well. If they're done, if the illustration is done really well, they tend to read very well as a thumbnail. And so yeah, I just went through my brushwork right here. Uh, again, like I said, I typically use photos for my details, but for this one, I decided to go with brushes. And you could see me do the circle, like a group of circle brushes, and then just crack brushes and just kind of just put it everywhere on this on this guy's skin, making it look like. The cracks I decided to make it look like veins, like bulging veins, and 
Of course, the little circles I made it look like they're pimples slash uh, boils slash um, skin pigmentation of some sort. So yeah, that's what ended up becoming my details. In the end, I pretty much just ended up drawing the chains by itself because that photo bash, the photo bash chains that I use, it didn't look, it didn't look right. It didn't look very good. So I just ended up just kind of making it all up and just painting it my own way. I'm not so sure why I decided to wait the very last minute to put the ball of spikes in. Um, I already had it in my mind to put them in even before now. Um, but for some odd reason I didn't even make marks to indicate that I was going to put them in. I kind of just left them up until the very last moment but yeah you can see right here that I decided to put the ball of spikes in finally um, I've been seeing it in my head before I actually finally put it in and it took me this long to actually make that mental image a reality gonna start detailing the face mask in. Originally I was just gonna leave it as is but then I realized that it was too plain so I ended up adding cracks into the skull. I really should have used reference for the skull because even though the skull looks fine and okay uh, I feel like it could be 10 times better if I had used an actual skull or if I had looked an actual skull. I mean it goes well with the rest of the piece now that I look at it. And I just feel like it could have been a lot better.
So at this point there's really not that much to say. Um, a lot of the rendering process uh, is pretty much just straightforward. It's just defining edges, adding the highlights, uh, adding shadows when shadows are needed. That's pretty much just what the bulk of uh, the rest of the rendering process is. So yeah, now that I, you know, pretty much have everything laid out and set as to the overall look and everything that I wanted, you know, everything is just pretty much just adding the details in. I did so I did have quite a lot of corrections though. I mean, I ended up having to go back over the shoulder plates again and redoing some of the details. Um, the overall shape I pretty much retained. But the Baroque engraving, I ended up changing around quite a few times because it kind of looks like a bunch of snakes in all honesty. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to make that look a little bit better so I remember going over it. I know for the chest plate, I ended up changing it around just because I, I was not too happy with it. I fussed over it a lot. Like I remember, yeah, I I remember going over the chest plate in three different sessions just because I was not happy with it. Every time I look at it, it just it looked off to me. So I had to keep going back over it. But again, that's part of the process, you know, balancing, rebalancing. Uh, seeing if it works, seeing if something doesn't work. Here's the hanging belts of spiky balls. <laughs> I'm about to start rendering it. I wouldn't really I don't really know what the correct term for for those hanging things are. I, I'm sure there's a fashion term for it. Uh, but right off the top of my head I can't think of it. Here I am adding some more cracks into the bones and skulls, skulls and bones. Thank you. 
doing some more brushwork or adding texture and details with brushwork. Which again, like I mentioned earlier, is very rare for me since I always use photos for details like these. Adding some highlights into the skull area. Once again, I'm redoing the background skin just because I wasn't so happy with it. Just me constantly fussing over it, which is really part of the detailing process, you know. the cracks texture using a brush instead of photos just really pushing those details in you know
So now that we are in the detailing process, everything just pretty much becomes like rinse and repeat. Um, this is typically the part where I start losing my patience. Uh, because this is the part that kind of sort of gets boring in a way. Uh, you're looking at the same photo day in day out and you're doing the same process uh, which is just adding the details uh, you know delineating your edges edges um, refining your highlights and your shadows um, rinse repeat it's not like the initial process where you're, you know when you're photo bashing and when you're adding you know, rough patches of, of details and you know, whatnot. I mean, the first steps of a painting of a long illustration are almost always exciting because everything is like new, like minute by minute. You know, every single thing that you add and every single thing that you take away, you know, again, like there's this like constant tug of war for balance, you know, how everything is like being united but it goes by so fast and so quick you know you dismiss ideas you add ideas like on the fly as fast as you can you know but as soon as you get to that point where it starts the detail process that's the process that just gets really long and tedious in a way you know where it really tries my patience because at this point this is the point where I'm just like I, I want to see the finished version already because at this point I'm already seeing it in my head you know based on the thumbnail that I'm looking at based on on what I'm seeing with the rough uh, details and I already know what the final image is gonna look like based on the rough details but obviously the detail still needs to be hammered out it still needs to be clearly delineated um, so yeah this is just kind of like the boring part of the illustration in a way nothing really happens much you know um, sometimes things do change you know like I said uh, I ended up switching the faceplate and the shoulder plates eventually because I still was not happy with the look but right now it's off this moment even if I hadn't changed the faceplate or the shoulder plates it, it goes harmoniously well with the rest of the piece already that even without those edits, the piece would still have worked, you know. Um, but yeah, th those two things are just about the big changes that happen. Everything else is just detailing things out, you know. Um, the skin, the look of the skin, like I said, I, I wasn't too happy. And I kept changing it. But finally, at this point, I, I was happy with what I'm seeing. What I have put down, I'm happy with. So, you know, no more changes essentially happen with the skin. The only thing that was left that, you know, was sort of out of field or, you know, out of the blue was, again, like I said, the shoulder plates and the, the chest plate. When she'll see in a few minutes how it turned things around and changed it. I also neglected to mention that I like working in one layer. I, I know there's quite a lot of artists who uh, do the multi-layer approach and they're very good at it. They're excellent at it. But I love my one layer. It's very much like painting on canvas, you know. If you make a mistake, you know, you don't just edit the layer that that mistake was on you you know paint over your mistake that's what you do when you're painting one layer it it feels a lot more natural for me
finally detailing the swords out. And again, here I am fussing over the chest plate. Keep looking at the Baroque patterns and they just keep looking like snakes to me. So I'm like, well, why not turn it into snakes? But then I didn't like it, <laughs> so I ended up changing everything again. Here I am erasing everything out. So that's kind of what I wanted originally, the image of that gilded Baroque pattern. That's essentially what I wanted the chest plate to look like. And you can see I'm trying to work this texture that I got from textures.com. I'm, I'm trying to use it as my chest plate instead, you know, photo bashing it in. But even this particular piece, I didn't like the look of it either. So I ended up having to erase this one as well. Man, I fussed about this so much. <laughs> I worked on this so much. I worked this and reworked it. This faceplate. I remember being so frustrated about it.
so this illustration is about to come up to its end and uh before it ends uh, i guess i just want to say a few more notes in my head um i just uh wanted again to go over why i love this piece so much and it's because um uh, Everything just turned out well, balance-wise. The value was amazing. The lighting is great. Um, subject matter, I'm not, you know, this is not my regular forte. I typically don't do this kind of stuff. So, um, in terms of the illustration, the zombie centaur, it, it still is nowhere near as good as like the kind of artwork that you would see in Art Station. I mean, especially Peter Polak, for example, after his graphics, if you check out his stuff, his stuff is 10 times, 100 times better than my zombie centaur. He does zombie so well. So in terms of zombie, you know, look, it could still have been pushed a lot farther, you know. But given the fact that this is not my typical forte, that this is not something I typically do, I just love how it ended up working out for me given that you know like i said this is not my normal thing i'm normally a sci-fi guy I, I draw robots a lot in my sketchbook if you look at my sketchbook it's full of robots it's not full of zombies so yeah but this is part of the reason why i love this piece it is the first piece that has a really good set of value range for me it is the first piece that kind of felt almost like a renaissance painting, like a French classical renaissance painting just because of the uh, chiaroscuro look to it. I, I actually come to think of it, this is probably my first chiaroscuro style painting, you know. Plenty of darks, you know, and like a few light areas. Um, so yeah, this is like the one of the few reasons or the few reasons why i love this piece so much um but yeah and oh, i also wanted to go over like a uh, commented time lapses um this is my first experiment this is pretty much the first video i decided to do this on Originally, I wanted to do a scripted version, but the script was just taking too long to edit, so I decided to do this live, essentially. Uh, I'll watch the video live and then make my comments live, so my thoughts are very, very sporadic, essentially, so do forgive me for that. I do try my best to form cohesive thoughts while this is going on. Uh, sometimes you get to rambling, you know, and you just kind of just let loose and you just talk. <laughs> That's kind of what happens, so... Um, yeah i try to keep it art topic wise though so but as for commented time lapses really my goal for the channel i really just wanted to do time lapses but since i found myself with some available time i decided to experiment with it if i still have some time i might continue it you know um it all just really just depends i guess with time and whether i have a lot of it or not you know so yeah But that just about wraps it up for me, uh, thought-wise. Uh, and again, like I said, the rest of the video is just me going back over uh, the details, uh, hammering it out, just uh, adding the highlights, adding the shadows, marking things a lot clearer, um, rinse, repeat for the rest of it. All the details that I need to put in are pretty much in there and they're all solid. Everything else is just, you know, delineating everything. I use that word a lot today, delineate. <laughs> and I typically don't use that word that much. It's kind of funny.
and that's pretty much it for me folks uh, thanks for watching hit like and subscribe thank you